Hi, welcome to this information session. My name is Barry Johnston. I'm from Little Peeps Occupational Therapy for Kids. And today we're going to be talking about the OT screening assessment that your child would have participated in in their school, whether they're in kindy or pre-primary. So today we're going to be talking about what is OT in general and why OT is important, and especially in regards to the school age setting uh, in terms of their physical development and a child's self-regulation skills. We'll also be going through step by step what we did in the screen and what this might look like in your screening report and then give you some ideas of strategies you can use at home to boost your child's development. When we're looking at occupational therapy in a school setting, we're looking at a number of ways an OT or an occupational therapist can provide support. And traditionally that really relates about things relating to motor skill development such as handwriting, fine motor skills and gross motor skills. But we can also provide a pivotal role in areas such as self-regulation where we help the child with their social emotional skills in managing their behaviour, attention and their emotional management. This can really, when all of these physical factors and these self-regulation factors come together, it really allows a child to participate to the best of their ability in the classroom setting. And that's our purpose as OTs coming in to support families and children and teachers, is to ensure that child hits the ground running as they start their educational and lifelong journey. So when we're talking about OT in the classroom, a big focus on that is about their participation and ability to engage in all aspects of school. So whether it's in the playground, engaging in sport, or sitting at a desk and listening to the teacher's instructions, or picking up a pencil for handwriting. So some of the key factors that lead into this include strength and motor skills, fine motor skills, writing skills, being able to plan and attend and concentrate, their sensory processing as well as their ability to play and socialise. This House of OT really is a nice succinct summary of how we bring through uh, and explain a child's physical development and overall development. And when you think about your building a house, you often start the house, well you should start the house with the most important structural component of the house and that is the slab. So we know the slab or the foundation of our house gives us a house a lot of stability and structural integrity. And in a child's house of development, the slab or the foundation level are their sensory systems, their vision, touch, taste, smell and hearing. And when all of these are smoothly aligned, it's much easier for a child to put on the bricks and mortar of their house. And in the screening assessment, we actually specifically looked at the bricks and mortar of your child's house of development. It is very hard for us to come in and make an observation of your child's sensory skills, which are the slab of their house, but we can observe that through their behaviour and their ability to focus and attend. Finally, a child puts on the roof of their house, and that's more about those self-regulation skills such as behaviour management, attention and focus, as well as um, emotional management. But we know that a child of four or five doesn't have that roof of the house altogether just yet. So it's important that as an OT, we're looking at what we can actually say we can observe about your child rather than making a judgement based on something that we can't actually see in your child. Interestingly enough though, one of the biggest predictors of success in a child at four years of age is actually their ability to self-regulate. And this is something we're not actually looking at in the screening assessment. This actually comes from the Dunedin study, which is a longitudinal study based in New Zealand. So self-regulation is that ability to consistently regulate your own feelings and behaviours. And we know that children do learn to regulate feelings and behaviours by modelling off their parents or caregivers in their environment. But we also know that everyone is wired somewhat differently from a neurological point of view. So sometimes children have difficulties with self-regulation no matter how well they are modelled by the adults in their environment. And so as an OT we can often come in and look at that underlying neurology of your child. Self-regulation is a critical skill uh, and a de critical determining factor in our ability to succeed later on in life. So your ability to self-regulate at four is one of the biggest predictors of your success as an adult. And the measures of success for an adult was health, wealth and well-being. So the ability to maintain physical health, the ability to have a job and pay your bills and also your mental health and well-being. This is somewhat reassuring because it's not necessarily about your child's cognitive ability or sporting prowess or language skills, it's their ability to manage their behaviour and their emotions at four which indicate greater success later on in life. What this study also told us however is that even if a child has difficulty of four, 
if we provide intervention and support, early intervention, a small change in a child's self-regulation can have a significant impact later on positively. So it's really important, this is data that's telling us that early intervention is important. So if you think your child's self-regulation skills are not in line with their peers in their classroom or their cousins or siblings at four years of age, then it's important you seek advice from your classroom teacher or seek advice from a health professional as well about what kind of support you can put in place for that. Something that ties in quite neatly with this is sensory processing and this is something that OTs become quite heavily involved in. And we know that there's five main sensory systems that we teach our children, touch, taste, smell, hearing and vision. But there's two other really significant sensations that strongly impact on that child's ability to self-regulate but also on a child's physical development. And they are proprioception and vestibular input. Now this image here of the boy being squashed by the football, that really refers to proprioception. And you might have remembered from that House of OT, there was a word called proprioception in the slab level. So it's a sensory system. Now proprioceptors are located all through your muscle tendon and capsules. So when you move a part of your body, it sends a message to your brain. And when your brain receives that message, it releases neurotransmitters and they are chemicals. One is dopamine and that gets the body nice and aroused and alert and says, oh, party started. And the other is serotonin and that's coming in giving everyone a big bear hug and saying, yep, party started, but let's keep it together. So it's a really good organising neurotransmitter. We release that by moving our body. And so when we move our body, it's easier for us to learn how to self-regulate. The other one is the little girl on the swing, the big disc swing. And that relates to vestibular input. And again, it was a sensory system on the bottom of our house of development. And some children need a lot of movement. So you might be a little bit concerned when your child started kindy, you go, how are they ever going to sit still on the mat? And that's because that child needs lots of feedback in their body to feel like they are switched on. So this is just a reminder that if you've got someone who's wiggling on the mat, they're not going to be able to listen until they've had that need for movement met. And if you've got someone that needs lots of feedback in their body, they're not going to be able to listen or manage their behaviours until they've got that feedback in their body. So these are two really key factors that impact on a child's self-regulation, but we common see, commonly see these as areas that impact on a child's physical development as well. Which leads me into some other statistics as well. And this was released by UWA in 2019, so just last year, and they've conducted a longitudinal study which looked at a child's at a group of children in WA from 1994 to 2019 and they actually compared children's gross motor ability at four years of age. And the results are quite alarming and it's showing that our children in 2019 have significantly less gross motor abilities than they did in, 2000, uh, in 1994. Some of the things they measured were bouncing and catching a ball with one hand. In 1994, the average four-year-old could bounce and catch a ball 14 times in 20 seconds. But in 2019, the average ability of a four-year-old was only bouncing and catching the ball eight times. So that's a significant decline in the average four-year-old's eye-hand coordination skills. They also measured balance on one leg. And in 1994, the average ability was 22 seconds. The average ability now in 2019 was 15.4 seconds. So again, a really significant decline in children's balance skills over the last 25 years. So what we're almost seeing is a shift and the shift is coming down. The children are entering school at a younger age, but they're also entering without the skills that we used to have 25 years ago. So this is why a lot of schools are taking on board an OT screening process so we can highlight the children that might need support as they enter school and give them that support in a timely fashion rather than waiting for those challenges to snowball and make it really challenging for the school to engage, for the child to engage in the classroom. So as I said before, the screening assessment really looked at these bricks and mortars of your child's house of development. We weren't looking at the sensory systems and we weren't looking at self-regulation. We wanted to look at what we could see and objectively measure about your child's development. And so we looked at things including core strength, body awareness, which is also proprioception. We looked at ocular motor skills, motor planning, fine motor skills and pre-writing skills. 
Your child would have received a ranking either of emerging, developing or consolidating. Now emerging means they needed quite a bit of assistance with that and really had challenges with that uh, test item. Developing means they're nearly there, but with a bit more targeted practice, they'll probably get there. And consolidating means they could achieve the task with ease for their age. So if you were looking down your report, you would have seen those categories of core strength, proprioception, ocular motor, motor planning, fine motor. You would have listed all of the areas at what they scored and then an overall ranking scale at the end of emerging, developing or consolidating. So I'm going to work, walk you through those now from core strength all the way down to pre-writing skills talk about how we did the assessment and what it looks like um, and how you can support your child in that development at home. So core strength is often referred to as postural stability and it refers to a child who slumps at their desk, they might fidget or wiggle on the mat or they might fatigue really quickly. And we know that when we're building up our core strength, it can make our bodies more efficient. And when our big muscles are more efficient, it allows our body just to switch on and listen to what the key message of the teacher is. So we can last longer during the day and that makes our opportunities for learning a great deal more. So core strength, if you've been to a personal trainer, is always important. Always important to build up the big bulky muscles in your body. But from a fine motor perspective, if we have these big bulky muscles nice and strong and stable, it allows these muscles to work with ease. So core strength is a really important factor for building up your child's development. We do this by looking at core strength from these two poses here. So we ask your child to copy these poses. And the first one, we call it dead ant. And that's looking at the strength of the tummy muscles. We ask the child to hug their knees to their chest and lift their head off the floor. We want them to hold that for 20 seconds. The next one is Superman. And this is looking at the strength of the back, bottom and thighs. And we want them to lift their arms and legs off the floor and keeping these knees elevated as well. Again, a child of four to four and a half years should be able to hold these for 20 seconds. Across the board, we're seeing children do not have the strength that they used to have. This is in line with the UWA research that came out, but from all of the screening assessments we do throughout the year, we see a trend of probably about 70 to 80% of the children actually lack core strength and only rank emerging for this. So don't be alarmed if your child does have low core strength, but this is a, a, um, a motivation for you to make sure that you're doing targeted exercises to build up core strength. How do we build it up? We do lots of heavy work to the muscles and bones. We do lots of physical activities where they're huffing and puffing, but sometimes targeted exercises like these or really good poses from yoga are really good to build up core strength. But for those sedentary times, instead of reading a book on the couch and laying back like this, or if you're on an iPad or a device, leaning back on the couch, get them on the floor, propped up on their elbows, and that's really good at developing extension strength as well. The next item we looked at was proprioception, and you might remember that was the uh, a foundation level, so a sensory system in our body from that house of OT. And that really refers to our internal body awareness, knowing how all your bits and pieces are connected without having to think about it. If we don't have to think about our body, the fact that my bottom's on the chair, yep, my bottom's on the chair, then you can be more free to think and hear the key message from the teacher. So they, a child with poor proprioception will spend a lot of time thinking about that body of theirs rather than listening to the teacher. And the way we test this is a simple finger touching test and I'll show you the video of it now. We just ask them to touch each finger to their thumb and we do that on both hands and then we get them to do it with eyes shut. And when they're doing it with eyes shut, we're actually getting a really valid reflection on how their proprioception works. We see a lot of misfiring when their eyes are shut the tongue comes out their mouth or we see a lot of whole hands like this or the other hand helps manipulate as well. And so that's a reflection they don't have well developed proprioception. How do we improve proprioception? Lots and lots of heavy work where the muscles and bones are getting lots of feedback. So physical activity, physical activity, trampolining, carrying the shopping bags, going for a walk with the dog. Um, so we need to give feedback to the body through movement. And if that's not enough, sometimes we need to add things to the body, such as a wheat pack on the lap, sitting on a wobble cushion or stool at school, carrying their backpack. And if you're doing a sedentary activity, such as a puzzle, and they're finding it hard to sit and, and they're wiggly, then doing a gross motor or heavy work activity, such as the monkey bars, 
um, or some plank positions or yoga poses before that will really help boost their attention and concentration. So we've heard about core strength, we've heard about proprioception, and the key for both of these to improve them is physical activity. So that's going to be the key message coming through today is lots and lots of physical activity is required to boost physical development but also improve self-regulation. Another test item we look at is ocular motor skills and that's basically being able to use the eyes in a smooth and coordinated manner. Being able to isolate the eye muscles from the head muscles and the head muscles from the trunk as well. So we look at two things here. We look at convergence where I bring an item and I see how the eyes come in together. We want to see that they come in smoothly and come out smoothly. Sometimes we see lots of blinking or tears coming as well. So that's a sign that their muscle coordination of their eyes is working a lot. The other thing we look at is tracking skills. So we want to see that their eyes can do all the work rather than their head doing the work and rather than their trunk doing the work. And when they can dissociate their eye muscles from their head muscles, it's telling us a lot about the way they work and use their muscles in the rest of their body as well. Ocular motor skills are really important for reading and writing later on down the track. And what we do know is that generally these naturally develop. Your child will have their vision assessed in kindy by the community nurse. You can ask for a review of that. So we're not testing vision, we're just testing coordination of the eye muscles. You might have been recommended to see a developmental optometrist and we do that if we think there might be factors that aren't just related to eye muscles, it's about vision and so we suggest having vision assessment just to check that out. If it's just about coordination of the eye muscles, physical activity will help. So we know that by improving proprioception and core strength and boosting physical activity in the body, your ocular motor skills and control of your eye muscles will improve naturally as well. So it's best to invest time and energy into whole body work rather than just focusing on coordination of the eye muscles. The next item is motor planning and that's basically the ability to see an action and copy it. And that includes gross motor planning, fine motor planning and pre-writing skills. Motor planning has a really significant impact on letter formation and subsequently handwriting skills because it's such a motor based task thinking about a letter and how it's formed coordinating your hands and fingers to do that action. Children with poor motor planning may often seem uncoordinated and sit back before they have a turn and look at their peers having a go. They might just seem uncoordinated or disengage with activities that are too challenging for their motor skills. And based on the research that UWA released, we do know that children who are entering kindy aren't as coordinated as they used to be. So it's kind of like a new norm that we're seeing is more of the classroom will actually have challenges from their motor skills. Children, however, who consistently have challenges with motor skills into year one and beyond, they are at more risk of developing develop, developmental coordination disorder. And these are the children we really want to flag and monitor because they're the children that are more likely to disengage from physical activity. And the government wants us to be physically active because it's really good for our physical health but also our mental well-being. So it's vital that we get those kids participating in physical activity even if it's really challenging for them. These are the ways we uh, do the motor planning assessment. We look at them copying four body postures. So you can see here, one is with the hands on the head, one is with robot arms. We also do crossing hands on knees, and the other one is standing on one leg with one hand on one knee. So we look at how they can perform those motor actions. With this one, where we're crossing one hand over to the side of the body, that's actually looking at how they can cross the midline of their body with ease. So if they can do that naturally when they're doing one hand for a different function and the other hand for crossing the midline, it's telling us that they're pretty capable of crossing the midline, which is important for things such as hand dominance, but also body efficiency in the classroom. We also then ask them to copy three block poses or patterns. So we do a little bridge, we do an L shape and then a series of steps. And we want the child to copy those with minimal prompts. Sometimes we give them a verbal prompt, say, is it the same as mine? But ultimately we want to see if they can do this independently. And then we also ask them to copy these pre-writing. So just the black bold lines that you can see there, we present them with a worksheet and we ask them to copy those patterns in the box next to the picture. And that's leading us into seeing what their pre-writing letter formation abilities are going to be like. So children who enter kindy should be able to master a vertical line, horizontal line and a circle 
by the middle of pre-primary diagonals, sorry, by the middle of kindy diagonals, and by pre-primary they should have mastered all of these shapes with ease. So how do we improve motor planning? Lots and lots of body feedback, so lots of physical activity. Sometimes we need to give explicit instructions. So instead of just saying kick the ball, we might need to model it and show the child how to kick the ball. We may, might need to break it down and say bring your leg back, point your toe, bend your knee, kick the ball. We might need to range their leg through that motion to get them to know what it feels like as well. And just giving lots and lots of verbal encouragement and lots of repetition and lots of practice. Again, lots and lots of outside play, rough and tumble play and physical activity will improve your child's motor planning abilities from a fine motor or gross motor perspective. So physical activity is the key for everything we've talked about so far. We then moved on to look at fine motor skills and that's the ability to use our hands and fingers together in a coordinated manner. So here we're looking at factors such as the pincer grip, so using the thumb and index finger. We're also looking at how they use both hands together how they cross the midline in a foam motor task, their shoulder stability, and finally their hand and finger strength. So in this task here, after we'd copy, ask them to copy the block patterns, we ask them to pack them away. And we have about the 12 blocks scattered over the table, and we get them to pack them away using tongs and picking up the blocks and putting them in the bucket. So here we're determining strength, because does a block stay in the mouth of the tong or does it drop out? And we're also looking at crossing the midline. So we can see if they can cross over the midline as they pick up blocks from the opposite side of the table. This item looks at pincer fingers, so the ability to use their nipper fingers. And here we are, they are going to pick up the counters. We model the nipper fingers for them and show them what we expect. And they put the counters into the bucket. Here we're looking at the ability to use nipper fingers, but also their hand dominance. Which hand are they using more commonly? We want them to do this. We don't want to see fingers up in the air and we don't want to see the middle finger doing the work or all fingers doing the work. We want to see isolation of the index finger and the thumb doing the work. And finally, this last task where we're putting pegs on a plastic cup. In this example, we've got a plastic bowl. And when we put on a plastic cup, if you're not holding the cup, the cup falls over. So here we're looking at bilateral integration, which is using both sides of the body together. But ultimately we want to see hand dominance, we want to see pincer fingers, and we also are looking at strength of those pincer fingers. So when a child will often use three fingers in kindy to open a peg, but we should be able to expect them to open and shut a peg with just their pincer fingers. So how do we develop fine motor skills? Lots and lots of finger games and exercises and using lots of different tools in the hands and fingers. So not just scissors and pencils now that they're at school, but using Lego, tweezers, tongs, pegs, marbles, counters, um, spray bottles that are watering the insole plants, Play-Doh, Connect Four, jumping frogs, counters, spinning toys, wind up toys. And we really want to focus on isolating this before we then refine the grip and do things within our hand before we add speed. So the key is having lots and lots of different tools in our hands that will help develop our fine motor skills. And finally, now that our child's got lots of good gross motor skills and good strength and body awareness and motor planning, they've now got doing lots of good fine motor skills, we're now ready to look at their writing or pre-writing ability. And so when we're looking at writing skills, we're looking at pencil grip, their pencil pressure, their wrist position and their shoulder position and then we look at how they do use their hands to make meaningful marks on the paper. So we're looking at pencil skills and that includes a tripod grip and a quadrupod grip, whole hand grip. We're looking at wrist position and dynamic or static ability of the fingers to move the pencil. So I'm going to show you some pictures now. Here up the top row you can see a power grip. Then you see a digital pronate or dagger grip. Then we have one with fingers in extension. At the bottom we have fingers and extension at the tip of the pencil, but ultimately these two here down the bottom, tripod and quadrupod grip, are our gold standard of what we expect children to be able to use. We'll see children do enter kindy with a power grip or digital pronate grip, but we need to correct that straight away. So we need to give them prompts and say, oh, where's your wiggly fingers? Where's your wiggly fingers? Because we want to stop them continuing to use that primitive grasp. So our marker is at the end of kindy, 
the children are able to have a good quadrupod grip or a tripod grip. So tripod is three points of contact on the pencil and quadrupod is four points of contact on the pencil. So remember, a child still might have a power grip, but by the end of kindy, we need to give them enough prompts and enough physical development of their whole body so that they can naturally emerge out of that power grip. We're also looking at the wrist position of the hand. So ultimately, we want to see the wrist in extension. We don't want to see a hooking of the wrist because that limits the length of our muscle our tendons here in our hand and stops us using our fingers in a functional way. So we want to see wrist back and we see lots of movement in the fingers. Children who are in kindy are not expected to use their fingers. We see more hand or elbow movement for their drawing. And that's called a static grip. But by the middle of pre-primary, we expect to see a dynamic pencil grip as well. We also want to see how the wrist rests on the table surface. So you can imagine this arm is the table surface and this is my arm on the table surface. So when I'm writing, my wrist is on the table surface. But some children will have it elevated and some children also have the elbow elevated. And so we want to see by the end of kindy, both the arm and elbow remain on the table surface. Another thing we look at is pencil pressure and how hard the child presses on the pencil. And that's ultimately a reflection of their proprioception skills as well. One of the final things that might be in your report is whether your child is hypermobile. And what we do is we range the child's wrist, little fingers and elbows to see how mobile their joints are. So in this picture you can see here, the child is able to range their thumb to their forearm with a greater ease and greater range than most people. So if I'm doing it, I can't actually get my thumb to my forearm. And some children can get it really flat. So it's showing us that their child has lots of mobility in their joint. When a child has lots of mobility in their joint, it's very hard for them to lock and load that joint to stabilize it. If they can't stabilize their joint, then it's really hard to stabilize a tool in their hand. So sometimes if a child's hypermobile, it can give us uh, information as to perhaps why they are using more of a primitive grip, such as a power grip, or a dagger grip when they're writing. Hypermobility is very common in the population. Generally, we see about 20% of the population have benign hypermobility, which just means their muscles are a little bit more flexible as well as their ligaments and joints. This can be a really good advantage if it comes with strong muscles for someone like a gymnast, a dancer, or a footy player. Absolute advantage when you've got that extra range. Um, but for some children, if they've got the low muscle tone and hypermobility, it can mean they're really trying really hard to get control over that joint and control over the tool in their hand as well. So these children might fatigue because they're putting a lot more effort into their tool use as well. So this is something we need to be mindful of, but it still means that these children need to get lots and lots of physical activity to make sure their muscles can start compensating for that extra range in their joints. So in terms of pre-writing activities, don't always focus on pencil and paper. Use vertical surfaces such as a shower screen because that's really good for building up that shoulder stability. And use lots of different tools like tongs, tweezers, big thick crayons and little pencils and little chalks. So the more things we put in the hand, the more it will get used to how I manipulate my hands and fingers and muscles in a different way. And that's ultimately going to transition into a better pencil grip. We don't advocate for the use of pencil grips like you see down here in kindy. A child needs to have time to grow and develop all their whole body skills and then naturally develop their pencil grip before we need to compensate and add on something like this handy writer you can see down here. But by the middle of pre-primary, if your child is still struggling to get less fingers on the pencil, that's when we might consider using a pencil aid. So by the middle of pre-primary, if your child needs consistent prompting on using the pencil correctly, have a chat to your teacher and see what they can recommend or consult with an OT as well. And it's always important to remember to use the Peggy Lego patterns. So your teacher will be sending home information about the Peggy Lego patterns and there's verbal cues that go with that and your teacher may be explicitly teaching this to your children as part of their handwriting instruction. And so that's a really nice easy way to start the basis of handwriting without focusing and overloading the child with lots of letters and sounds, just focusing on drawing those key patterns as well. So what you can do at home to help. 
is remember that basically this is a journey, it's not a race. And the purpose of this screening assessment is to give you information so you can know where your child's strengths lay, but also know where they may need support to help them engage efficiently in the classroom. And you should see this flow and effect to managing themselves at home, whether it's pouring juice into a cup or feeding themselves their cereal with a spoon. And so it's really important that this is information for you. You may have been recommended to have some uh, group therapy or have therapy. You may have been recommended to have a further assessment. And so we are able to offer that on site at your school. However, you are also able to access the free health department service through the child development services. So you can Google child development services and complete an online referral for that service for yourself. There is a wait list for this service. However, it's still worthwhile going on the wait list if you think that your child might need some long-term ongoing assistance with these areas. But in the meantime, you would have heard the key message from today is lots and lots of physical activity. The more we can move our children's body, the better our physical development will, will engage and the better our self-regulation ability will be. So you've got a two-fold effect. Just by getting out and running around and having a play, you're going to improve self-regulation as well as their physical development. So physical development is, uh, activity is a really key recommendation of all screening assessments. You would have actually noticed that at the bottom of your report, it talked about the Australian Department of Health Physical Activity Guidelines. And for children under five years of age, the recommendation are three hours of physical activity. For children aged five to 12 years of age, the physical activity guidelines are one hour of physical activity, but no more than two hours of screen time. And so we really wanna limit that screen time because when we are watching a screen, we're more likely to be sedentary and not getting that feedback into our body. So we know that that sedentary behaviour does lead to negative health consequences and negative wellbeing consequences as well. So some things that you can do at home, yes, physical activity. Cosmic yoga is a great one that's free on YouTube and that's where a lady in a onesie tells a story about how to um, do all these yoga poses and it's really fun for children in kindy and pre-primary. There's also a Zen Den section to this, and this is about mindfulness and meditation for the young little ones as well. And that's really good if your children are coming home from school overwhelmed by that whole experience as well. It might be really beneficial for them. Progressive muscular relaxation is another great one, and you can just Google progressive muscular relaxation and they'll come up with lots of ideas for kids on how to teach your child to relax. Brain breaks are fun. So if you're practicing things at home, have a break, no more than five to 10 minutes of one activity at a time, and then slowly build up from them. But break it up with lots of physical activity, like you could do pencil pines, you could do a warrior pose from yoga, or you could do one of the supermans or dead ants that I've just shown you today. Animal Fun is another great program, and I'd encourage you to search animalfun.com.au because they have lots of information on there for parents, and it talks about how to use uh, the body like an animal. For example, you could um, be friendly fighting armadillos. And so on their website, they've got a great blog which gives you ideas of how to build, boost physical development of your child. And also check out the Australian Department of Health website and those physical activity guidelines that I mentioned of 60 minutes of physical activity as a minimum per day. As I mentioned, don't focus on spending lots of time doing activities. It should be incidental practice. None of this is designed to add burden to families or to teachers. We're truly trying to make this process of engaging in schools, and if your child needs support, making that easy to access that support. So looking at little opportunities throughout the day where you can look for increased opportunities for physical activity, where you can turn a little game into more of a fine motor activity, um, and, and just having that period, say, in the shower where you're drawing the shapes of the Peggy Lego program on the screen. So we're not saying sit down and practice fine motor activities or set up stations at home or at school. It's looking at what you naturally do already, and hopefully that will validate that what you're doing is supporting your child's physical development. So short bursts more often is what we recommend. If you're still struggling about whether you should follow on with the recommendations from your report or what, how to make sense of that all, talk to your teacher and ask them for support. They are a key expert in early childhood education. And a lot of this is validating what they're seeing in the classroom. But have an open and frank discussion with them about what you can do at home or whether it's worthwhile waiting and seeing how your child progresses just through that natural engagement in the kindy setting. 
We're also available for follow-up referrals and further assessment if you want to do that for your child and if particularly that was a recommendation. However, if you've seen a need for your child and it wasn't recommended to have further assessment, we're more than happy to support you and have that conversation as well. So you are more than welcome to contact us and the team at Little Peeps OT for Kids. I may be the OT visiting your school, but we have a number of OTs who currently support schools around uh, the south, uh, south of the river in Perth. But my name is Barry Johnston. I'm from Little Peeps OT for Kids. You're welcome to email me, barry at lil-peeps.com.au. And hopefully you found this screening information session beneficial and the screening report you received home giving you lots of information and a starting place of where to go on this journey with your child. All the best and I look forward to hearing from you soon.